أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل إن صلاتي ونصكي ومحياي ومماتي لله رب العالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله محمد وآل محمد I begin in the name of Allah the beneficent the merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is worthy of praise for giving us such honor by breathing his blessed spirit into us and giving us the opportunity by which to recognize his infinite mercy through his grace which is already embedded in our hearts so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually starts us off on the right footing Impl implying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us light as we mentioned before in Ayatul Kursi, Allah says, Allahu waliyu ladina amanu yukhrijuhum min al dhulumati ila al nur. Wal ladina kafaru awliyahum al taghud yukhrijunahum min al nur ila al dhulumat ulaik ashabu al nar hum fiha khalidun. Here it's an interesting verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah is the helper, the friend, the master of those. Allah waliyu ladina amanu, who believe in him, yukhrijum min al dhulumati ila al nur. He takes them out of darkness into light. The interesting part is the second part. Wal ladina kafaru awliyahum al taagut. And those who disbelieve in Allah, whose masters, whose friends, whose helpers are the demigods, taagut. They yukhrijunahum min al nuri ila al dhulumat. They taken them out of light into darkness. And Allah says, they are the inmates of fire who shall remain therein. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. فَذَكِّرْ إِنْ نَفَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى سَيَذَّكَّرُ مَنْ يَخْشَى Remind, reminding is beneficial. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us something very interesting in this verse and I'm just going to touch on it very briefly. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Very briefly, from the basic perspective that Allah has started us off with his light. Don't forget that. Our soul, the spirit of Allah resides in all of us. The purity of submission towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the entire human race. We are not born doomed and deemed to be evil and criminals on this earth. When people commit crimes, the likes of Muawiyah and Yazid and the Saddams and all the treacherous leaders of the world, you will find such individuals were not born treacherous. They were not born to be evil. They already have the ruh that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blew into the being, Adam being our father. What happens is that we are always starting off on the right footing. Then there is the element of transaction, which you and I are given free will, limited free will, by which to choose our own destiny. So when we say, for example, that Laylatul Qadr is the night of destiny, here the, the Qadha and Qadr. If you look at the Qadr, you see Qadha is when Allah decrees something. إِذَا قَضَىٰ أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ When Allah decrees a matter, He says to it be and it is. 
other on the other hand is what we transact in the limited free will I'll give you a quick example so you understand where I'm going with this Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib والسلام, was once leaning on a wall and the companions were sitting next to him and he looked up and he saw the wall is leaning a little bit so he stood up and moved to another wall so all the companions followed him and they sat with him and they said Amir al-Mu'mineen why did you do that he said I moved from one destiny to another so they asked him, what do you mean he said that wall appears like it's going to fall and there is a destiny decree that if that wall is weak it will fall and if I'm under it I will be harmed but through my limited free will I have recognized the qada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the limited qadr that I have I'm going to transact in it to make sure I move away from harm's way so therefore your limited free will is under the same condition that the physical laws of the universe are designed where if two cars come towards each other at a certain speed you are going to have an accident this is the law of physics the law which has been decreed by Allah and you and I cannot change it we can manipulate it but we cannot change it we can move around it and work with it but we cannot change the forces of gravity for example we cannot change the methods of how mathematics works we cannot change them we can only work with them here the Qadr Laylatul Qadr for example is when you and I engage in this limited free will in this engagement ultimately gives credence to the quality of how my inner soul my heart which Allah has breathed his perfect spirit into is going to be expressed so the beauty of the human race is that if you and I keep away from haram out of the ahkam al khamsa the five laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wajib haram makru mustahab and mubah you will find that the most important one the most important two are wajib and haram of the two the most important is the haram if you and I can keep away from the haram something natural in my ethos in my fitra as we call it is going to come out and I will naturally gravitate towards the good I don't have to struggle hard to be good then because I'm already created good Allah creates everything good everything God creates is good its start is good it's when mankind through their limited free will willfully rejects the mercy of Allah that what happens is our soul nafs which is has a tendency of amaratun bisu as Yusuf says in nafs al amaratun bisu you see illa ma rahima rabbi yusuf alayhi salam recognizes that when this woman is calling him he knows that there is this inclination in this direction and in this inclination you find insan can ten tends to go away because the touch the limited pleasures that we get the glittering lights and the euphoric feeling for a short while is a distractor that distraction has to be overcome with an intelligent mind which is connected to the heart the heart is where we see it's a beautiful statement of Imam Ali salam. they asked him said have you seen God he said I worship no God until I see him so they said Amir al-Mu'mineen how can you see God he says eyes do not perceive him hearts perceive him Qulub, the qalb. So you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Have they not traveled in the land? Look at the question. أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُ Look at the question. I want you to ponder for a second about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how he communicates with us the method of communication in the Quran is an indicator of who we are in the eyes of God please don't forget that. we are slaves to God do you agree of course but look how Allah talks to us typical a master does not talk to his slave this way a master commands whips the slave and makes them work like dogs you don't question intelligently a slave but look at this slave that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you and I 
that he has honored us so much that he honored the children of Adam such that he breathed his own spirit into him, commanded the angels to bow to him. Because Allah says what possesses in you is so powerful that if you understand its value, you will not commit a single sin on earth. We don't understand its value. Hence we deviate, we do wrong things. So when Yusuf recognizes this intense power of his heart and he sees shaitan is calling him, Although shaitan cannot touch prophets. But Yusuf salam is making that comment that inna nafsala ammaratum bisu. For yes, I'm a human being too. The attractions are there. But I have transcended that because my heart sees Allah. My heart is fully submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No shaitan can touch me. Even Iblis says, illa ibadaka minhumul mukhlaseen. I will fabi'izzatika la ghuyannahum ajma'in. I will misguide all of them except the purified ones. Why? Because the purified ones see Allah through the hearts, not through the eyes. So when Zulekha is trying to attract Yusuf, she cannot. When people try to get the prophets to do wrong things, they cannot. Because their heart is seeing Allah, not their eyes. Here Allah is asking, have you not traveled in the land so that they should have hearts with which to understand? Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to be a proactive seeker of knowledge. He wants me to be a proactive introspector, a proactive questioner of my own dignity and my own value in life. That he has given me such abilities with the eyes and the ears and the mind and the five senses with the sixth being the intuition, which is the most powerful collection of all the forces. If I take all my five senses and I focus them, I get a third, a higher sense, which is intuition. Scientists call it many different names, the sixth sense. It's a collection of all that has no language. You cannot articulate that. They say when Rod Labor was asked the question, that any time a person who's playing tennis throws the ball to serve, before he strikes the ball, with 100% accuracy, he knows if the ball will be a good shot or a bad one. A scientist asked him, Rod Laver, you're a world-class tennis player. How is it that you know this? With 100% accuracy, that as soon as a tennis player tosses a ball in the air, you know if that ball is going to go in or not, because he has not struck the ball yet. He says, my intuition tells me exactly, but I cannot articulate it logically. There is no logic or rationality in it. Why? Because there's a sixth sense that connects all the five, that takes it to the heart level, where it touches the reality of the universe temporarily, that an expert is given access to something that's mechanical, but he has the power to predict something with 100% accuracy which defies all methods of logical sciences but yet science knows there's a dimension that is beyond the logical five senses that is also logical but we don't have access to its understanding that sixth sense brothers and sisters at the heart level this is just a mechanical thing of a person like Rod Laver who sees a tennis ball the passion when we talk about passion, when you touch your passion, you find when a person is passionately material, for example, they love material. They have a dream. If you ever watch that show called The Secret. In The Secret, they say, if you keep thinking about what you want, you get it. It's the power of the mind. But in the entire show, The Secret, all they talked about was material acquisitions. All about material acquisition. I dreamed about, I had a dream about this palace. I got the palace. I had a dream about being a big corporate mog. I got it. I had a dream. It's all about material dreams. Even at that level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives it to them. So you find even in the secret, they talk about when you think about something long enough, you have enough of a passion, you direct yourself in that direction. It's true. When a man desperately wants a woman, he's going to get one. When a woman desperately wants a man, she's going to get one. When you desperately want to rob someone, you'll rob someone, guaranteed. When you desperately want to kill someone, you'll kill someone. That's the passion we have. The sad thing, of course, is these are material things that are passionately sometimes misdriven. Hence, we understand that the impetus for doing something, even wrong, is so powerful and overwhelming that the issue and the entity of laziness 
and not having any will to do something is out the window. I have never found a human being on earth. When someone says, my daughter or my son is very lazy, they're extremely lazy. You have to really bribe them to do something. You know, they are just so lethargic and lazy, always giving excuses not to do something. It's just in their nature, you know, they're just naturally lazy. I beg to differ. No child in the world is naturally lazy. I beg to differ. I have never in my entire life seen a human being who's naturally lazy. Impossible. A human being's gravitation of power is so intensive, but you have to excite it. When a child is misappropriated with information, when a child is not given the right knowledge, the right abilities, the right tastes, they won't go after it. The same child who's rambunctious and would dare not sit for five minutes if you're talking to him, you put a nice movie that he likes, he won't flicker an eye for two hours. How is that? Hmm? The same lazy child, when he sees something glowing and he or she likes that color, they will run even though they're obese. Why? Because the inner passion is there. It's just been stuffed with trash that he can't move anymore. It is so debilitated, it can't think right. The light of Allah is hidden. Why? Because they made wrong choices in their destiny, which has led them to make many a mistakes, which has now caused their hearts to be ossified, fossilized. That when our hearts become very hard, it's because so many wrong things have gone in it. The hearts don't become hard until they're filled with sins. So our avoidance of sins requires rationality and understanding. And the passion that I'm talking about has to be driven at a different level. Let me describe it. I give a simple example. I mentioned Simon Sinek yesterday. He gives a comparison between Apple and other major companies like HP and Dell. You notice Apple makes the iPad, we're all using it. Well, the other companies like Samsung, they're also very good in making tablets. How come most people don't buy them? Most people want to buy the Apple, for example, um, laptop. Why? Others can make it just like that. No one wants to buy it. Because if you go deep into it, as much as Apple is very, very business conscious and profit conscious, but at the heart of the engineering, there must be passion coming out that comes outward, but it's still material. He gives an example of the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers, as you know, are the first people to put a plane in the air. At the same time, there was a multi-million dollar project. Multi-million dollar project in that time, okay, that was a lot of money, to come up with an aircraft that will fly. They didn't come up with it. Yet the Wright brothers sold all their wealth to buy the tools to be able to fly. And they came up with the first tool. They came up with the first flight, known as the Wright brothers' plane, right? Why was that the case? Because they were passionate about it. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about popularity. It was a passion to do something they loved. But here's the interesting thing. We all admire that, don't we? Don't we admire that? We admire such people. Wow, Thomas Edison? You had such a passion that you discovered this light bulb. Wow, that's amazing. If you break it down, you will see that what really made Thomas Edison and the Wright brothers work was the potential to find the answer. Don't forget that. You and I can never go into a laboratory or be an inventor unless you and I agree that there is a potential to crack the code of the universe by which I have access to it so that I can use it to benefit me. And I love that as a scientist. If you ever see a true scientist, they don't care about anything. They just love to look at the secret of the universe. They'll spend a lifetime in the jungles monitoring insects crawling into a hole while they're in heat and very uncomfortable. You say, I would never be in this state. For days you're recording. They say, we don't care. We're in love with examining how the universe works. What's at the passion level? Two things. The love for the thing and the potential to crack it. If there was no potential, you lose the passion. If I'm going into the lab and I know no matter how many experiments I do, I will not crack the code, I will lose my desire to do it. 
Now take it at another level. This is why I'm talking about the importance. All these people I just gave you as examples are all material acquirers. They're trying to crack the code on a material level. Mechanical levels, where you and I can crack the code at a mechanical level. I can be a scientist at a mechanical level. I can be a physicist among the scientists, or a chemist, or a biologist among the scientists to crack the code, or a mathematician. Fine. But what does it do for me other than that, besides give me nice phones, and nice pads, and nice laptops to click on? What do I do after that? They glow in the dark. So what? They're all made of, you know, high-class aluminum. So? Well, it's nice. Okay, so you notice our acquisitions reach a level where it taps off and now you need to come up with newer inventions, faster processors, more bells and whistles because we have an insatiable desire for the material pursuits. Don't we all agree with this? Yes, but brothers and sisters, can you compare that with the passion of a person who's striving to achieve high moral standards? So when a person goes into prayer, people say, what are you doing? He says, I have a passion. What's your passion? There's nothing there. He says, no. See, you don't believe there's anything there. But you will find that the human race at the highest level is at the moral level. And the passion to do good and forbid evil is of the highest moral character. And none of us would have had, even if I ask an atheist, I said, you, you believe that we should promote good? He said, yes. I said, there you go. So you do believe that there is the potential of greatness. He said, yes. I said, there it is. Subhanallah. A believer in Allah understands that, that the origin of my creation is the ultimate good. And my return is the ultimate good. That's my belief in the day of judgment. My belief in the belief in, uh, in hell and heaven. Paradise and hell are precisely logical. Because when you and I pursue at the highest level of moral injunctions to promote good and forbid evil, we are the highest human beings. We transcend the mechanical world. As much as we admire scientists, the greatest admiration should be for the moralist who promotes Allah's way. That's why Allah says, Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrajat lil nas ta'amuruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. You are the best in the community. You promote good, you forbid evil, and you believe in Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa muhammad wa muhammad. So what does Allah say? Have you traveled in the land? So that they should have hearts with which to understand. That means Allah is telling me, Hassanain, my religion does not forbid you from questioning. My religion has been placed in your heart that you better question yourself and question everyone around you. And for what I have put into you, if you knew its value, you would never stop serving me. And you would love doing it. You would love to die for me. To death. Yeah, that's why Allah says, "Qul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alam." Look at these four components: salati, my prayer; nusuki, my sacrifice; mahiyaya, my life; wa mamati, and my death. Lillahi Rabbil Alameen. For Allah. What does that mean? It's the ultimate goal of this passion, driven with potentials to do greater, because the heart already has it. All it takes is to tap into the passion through good transactions and to avoid the evil transactions. And Allah says, you will not know how to go unless I guide you. So there's another component of the heart. As much as all of us have this intuition that evil is bad, good promotions are ultimate. Progression is superior to regression. Even scientists will tell you that the evolutionary model could not survive unless it's progressive. I said, who dictated that? Because evolution is also bound in that system. Who dictated that? For evolution could not dictate that. It's a mechanical system that works progressively. How did evolution think about it? There is an intelligent question to be asked that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking that you in your own fitra know that progression is superior to regression. That when something can survive for long periods of time, it is superior than its extinction. Who dictated that? And how did science figure that out? And when we did figure out, it was only an observation. We didn't manufacture it. We just observed it. We're just observing it. In fact, we know with awe that one of the conditions of a living entity is its ability to procreate and replicate and make more of itself. Otherwise, it will become extinct in the scope of time. How does it reach that? 
This question you and I often bury it, we don't ask. We take the mechanics and we walk off the mechanics. Allah says, no, a believer questions that. He says, have they not gone to the lands and seen? What has happened? Go look what happened to those people before you. Why is Allah telling me this? Allah says, if you don't evaluate yourself, if you don't evaluate my universe, if you don't evaluate why you exist, you will not be passionate. You will not have the passion to pray to me. You will not have the passion to die for me. You will not have the passion to sacrifice yourself for me. Impossible. When you and I put and gauge the value of our lives and the real value, and in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He says, should they have hearts which which to understand or ears for which to hear? Hmm? Surely it is not the eyes that are blind, but blind are the hearts which are in the breasts. Here, Allah speaks about my inner conscience. When my soul is disconnected due to bad behavior, you find I lose my passion for things. I become apathetic. I become low-level beast. I become passionate in the sexual conduct, in the material sense, and I start going for my animal passions. Anything that excites me, I go after it. She's pretty, let's go after her. Oh, it's a nice house, I want it. He's richer, I want to be richer. It's all material, it's all surface, no depth. Such individuals are dangerous. Today, what's happening in the world, if you examine, last night I was watching a video that's gone viral about what's happening in Syria. They're claiming to be people fighting for their rights. These are not for people fighting for their rights. These are animals. These, the ones who are fighting in Syria are not freedom fighters. These are not local Syrians. These are paid vigilantes to go and kill and cause chaos in the world. Did you see the video yesterday? They took this man, they threw him from a building, and then they, they took another man, they threw him on the floor. They couldn't stop shooting him. Machine guns, they kept shooting him, shooting him, shooting him. The man's dead. They're kicking him, shooting him. I said, why is the person doing this? Because they have lost connection with Allah. فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, hell is their abode. أُولَيْكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ When you want to ask the question, where, why is hell there? Why in this mercy of God did God create hell? Examine the potential of mankind's elevation to the highest level of paradise. Allah says your trial dictates the existence of hell by your own misdeeds. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us. So in, in Ayat al-Kursi when Allah says that that light which he takes the believers towards it, that light is already there. It means through Quran, through Rasulullah. Through my consciousness, through Aimma, through all the signs of Allah, the Kaaba. You look at, uh, for example, Safa and Marwa, Sha'ir Allah. These are signs of Allah. Allah says, through these, I take you to the light. See? Furqan. The Quran is a Furqan. Alhamdulillah, hmm? the Anzal al Furqan, ala abdihi. لِيَكُونَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ نَذِيرًا Nadira means to show it clearly, to guide it to the light. We already have the light. It's the action and the transaction by which you and I perform which will open up this light. But how do you and I reach the transaction level? That's the key question. But before I go here, first notice what Allah is saying in this Surah Al-Hajj 46. He says, have you not traveled? Why? Allah says, use your mind. Use your integrity. You know, when I was a child, when I grew up actually, not a child, when I was in the university and I was having all these debates with atheists and Christians and agnostics and Jews and all people, Buddhists, I was having a fantastic time of my life. For the first time, I made a decision that I'm going to question everything. Even though I'm a Muslim, even though I'm a follower of Ahlul Bayt, how do I know I'm right? Maybe I inherited this religion. Maybe somebody fooled me, just like everybody else, because the way of God is only one. In Nadina in the Lail Islam, that even if I didn't read this ayah, logically and rationally I would say that the religion of Allah is one. It cannot be multiple ways. God is very clear in distinguishing truth that even in the court of law, the judge can decipher the truth from lies through multiple questioning and angles. 
Why is that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only one way. One way, not two, not three. So I knew there is only one way. The question was, how was I going to find out this one way? So I had my discussions with the Christians. Good people. Church of Christ would always come to my door telling me about why it is important to be saved. But I always asked them, this merciful God, why did he damn me to start with? I cannot accept a Lord who starts me on the wrong footing. I cannot accept that. It defies my logical, rational capabilities that if I were to meet you and I don't give you the benefit of the doubt, I am a treacherous creature in the human social system. That if I meet you and I damn you the first time I meet you, I am not a good person. So between us, if we don't give the benefit of the doubt, how come this God that you believe in is not giving me the benefit of the doubt? Why is he dooming me? And why am I inheriting something? When Jesus, even in the Bible says, none shall bear the burden of the other. Why am I bearing this burden? The Quran says, Wala taziru wa aziratun. Wizra, ukhra. Nobody bears the burden of the other when it comes to matters of deeds. I couldn't get an answer. The more I went into it, the more I spoke with atheists, the more I realized, wow, what I have is beyond description. And I started to have Moments in life when I'm sitting there, I started reading the seerah of Rasulullah. There's a book by Muhammad Hussein Haikal. It's written Al Hayat Muhammad. He comes from the school of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Oh, what a beautiful collection of the stories of the Prophet, the Holy Prophet's life, seerah. I was so deeply indulged in it. I started feeling the Prophet. I said, Who are you? I've been claiming you are my Prophet. I don't know you. I don't even know what you did. I'm just doing the shahada, shahadana Muhammad Rasulullah. But who are you? You are the most important man in the Quran, I see. Allah says to me, no man, an nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet has greater right on his believers than the believers have upon themselves. Who are you? The more I started to read, the more I started to feel the Prophet. Heart to heart. Different. Not the Prophet went here and he said this and he fought and then mashallah he made such a hadith and then he said this and he signed this treaty. No, 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 I wasn't interested in that. I was not interested in being entertained, I'm sorry. I wanted to know the heart of the Prophet. Who are you? How do you have this passion? And what makes you so good? And the more I read, and believe me, I'm saying this earnestly, I haven't even scratched that conversation yet in my life. Not that I've dug deep into it. But that aroma, that fragrance, oh my God. I can't describe it. Subhanallah. So real that the more I put it in action, the more it starts to flower. Wow. Subhanallah. So as I started reading this, I came to a realization that I'm chosen. Of all the probabilities in my life, I could have been a drug addict. I could have conceived an illegitimate child and stuck in that way. I could have been a crook. My father could have raised me in a horrible way. I could have been an abused child. But God prevented all of that. Wow. Growing up in America, in New York City, called the Sin City, I survived. You know, I started to cry every night. And I said, I see what you mean, Allah. Not only have you chosen me, because the more I examine it, every person, including that atheist who's having discussion with me, I said, why, you are also chosen. You are all chosen. We're all chosen. Something innate in me started saying to me, yes. So what are you going to do about it? People ask me, what's this passion? I don't have the passion. Don't, don't get me wrong. I don't pretend to have it. I wish I had it. But let me say to you, people ask, this passion that you have, what is it? I said, all I did was I assessed the value. And the value is some of us are, are more advanced than others. So there will be nights when I'd cry and I said, what about that child who's just been killed in Africa right now? What about that child in the Middle East who was just shot right now? Last night, I cried two nights ago. I saw a young boy's picture, Afghan young child in Syria, hung on a rope. A three-year-old boy hung on a rope. Honestly, I couldn't stop crying. 
I looked at my daughter and I held her and I said, my God, what if somebody grabs this child of mine and hangs them? Who are these people who have the audacity to kill? They killed the whole family. This boy witnessed it. Then they took the boy, they put him on a, on a rope and they hung him. These are the insurgents fighting for freedom in Syria. There is a rawayat. There will be turmoil in Syria before the coming of Imam Mahdi ta'ala faraj. That Syria will be a hotbed of killing. And it will spill from there around the entire Middle East. And you will see something amazing come out. It's happening, brothers and sisters. The passion is there. Trust me, there is much. Only Allah knows when our blessed Imam will come. But the desire, the intadar of Imam Mahdi والسلام, to come back and to get rid of this filth of taking innocent children and hanging them. I'm thinking, what wrong did this child do first to witness his own family's death? Then the trauma of being hung and killed and you see this lifeless body hanging. What are these human beings? Even animals. Believe me, I can't compare animals with these people. Lower, worse. Why? Because they haven't understood the gift of Allah, hence hell. You and I need to understand the gift of Allah. Not to do it for money. Don't do it for power. Don't do it for notoriety. Subhanallah, we have so many people doing philanthropic work, but deep in their hearts, it's for me, my CV. How much will the world pra you know, praise me? Look at all my, my accomplishments in the world. Look how many thousands and millions of people I have fed. Who cares about that? With the, uh, with the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you and I fed the entire universe, we can't pay Allah back. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing it for money? Why are we doing it for power? Tell me. Because we haven't valued Allah's gift. I vowed when I did that in my school. I said the true intent of my messenger, I never saw him asking for money. I see Imam Ali alayhi salam next to him, giving his life, protecting the Prophet. He was the fall guy, by the way. Imam Ali alayhi salam, I'll tell you how he's the fall guy. You see, the messenger of Allah is rahmatun lil alameen. He is a mercy unto all. He never killed an individual. Somebody needed to defend Islam. Imam Ali took that fall. That when his life was on the line, everybody wanted him dead. Because he was the sword that defended the prophet. So he was the fall guy. His sacrifice is of the highest character for the prophet. To make sure that the messenger beams and glows to such an elegant level, Imam had to take the blood in his own family and in his own life, that his entire generation is being hit. That until today you go to Syria and Muslim countries and see who are they targeting. The lovers of Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Today, brothers and sisters, we must evaluate. Somebody asked me, how much do I, how do I get this passion? Evaluate. Look around and see. Allah will give you money. Trust me, He will give you money. He will test you. Loss of wealth, much wealth. Beautiful wife, beautiful children, beautiful husband. Allah will test you. What are you going to do with it? I'll give you eloquence in speech. I'll give you strength. I'll give you beauty. I'll give you wealth. What are you going to do with it? If you are foolish to think that that's what's going to give you credibility, you are a fool. When you examine the value of this world, when Allah says, Al Malu wal Banun, Zinatul Hayatid Dunya, Wal Baqiyatul Salihat, Khairun in the Rabbika Thawaban. Allah is telling me very clearly, if you understand this value and what I have chosen you for, and I have given you access to something others have not gotten. So I used to cry, how come the child is dying, but I am chosen? How come everybody didn't get it? In the heart of hearts, I asked this question to the Messenger of Allah, to the Holy Prophet, the Quran, the Aima. And Allah answers, He says, we choose some of others. Not because the ones who have not been chosen have been deprived. No. They are under trial and in this free will world, since you are ahead of the pack, are you looking behind to help? Or are you selfish and arrogant and moving alone? So when I realize, wait, I see what it is. See, the world has all been given the chance to do good. Those children who are being killed today who are poor or who are being marginalized and being shot at point blank, 
they didn't earn it. Some fools who have rejected Allah are doing that. And I realized very tacitly that my silence is acquiescence to this haram act of these people. Meaning if I don't rise and I don't do something proactively, I am no different than that person who's committing the crime. Because Allah says in Allah, You need to rise. You need to evaluate yourself. Rise. You notice in the world today, what are we doing? If you look at all our efforts, they're all in damage control. Brother, can we do something? My child is lost. Brother, can you help me? My daughter is doing bad thing. Brother, can we do this? Can we do that? Can we try to save our children? What's the problem? Oh, many problems. We're always doing damage control, which is okay. But that's not a wise community. A wise community is efficient. They don't put all their efforts in damage control. It implies they were a lazy community. It implies they were not proactive. They let things go too far. And then they needed to do damage control. Just like when Imam Ali salam was taken as the fourth Khalifa, there was too much damage being done. And Imam now was brought to fix the problem. But Muawiyah was already in his ditches. It was too hard to fix it. And the echoes of the Umayyads, you see it in the world today. That the damage is taking place in the world today is at that level. Why should we be doing damage control when Islam is a religion of prevention is better than cure? And that means that you and I need to be proactive at an early stage to say, what can I do with this young child that before he goes astray, I can create systems by which these young generations are protected from going out of their lines. So when I came back from my university, I thanked Allah and I prayed to him and I said, I don't know what to do. As much as I've read about my messenger, as much as I am intrigued by the beauty of Islam, and the more I indulge in such conversations, I, I deconstructed my whole religion and I reconstructed it systematically on every question. And I don't have, and I don't claim to have answers to all, but the fundamental pieces, oh, it is so clear. It is night and day. Sometimes it's absurdly clear. Absurd here with uh, care with the word when I say, meaning it is too clear. So when I took that stance, I realized one thing very interesting. I said, our obligation in Dean is to articulate the simplicity of the message, not the complexity. Allah on Judgment Day will question us about the sincerity of realization at this level. Nothing more. Look in the mirror, look at your eyebrows, look at your nose, and see how valuable am I. Take your child, caress their hair, and say, what's the value of this hair? How much would I pay if my child had no hair, if they were born without hair, how much would I pay to have my child have hair? Sounds a bit ridiculous, doesn't it? But that's true. When I touch these young boys, I look at them, and I touch their hair, I said, how much would a person pay for that hair? Priceless. We'll give all our money. Just hair. Allah says, have you evaluated? Hmm? We gave you life, we gave you sight, hearing and sight, hmm? heart, little you are grateful. Little you are grateful. So the passion comes in evaluating. Look around. The money kills people. It does good work too, but it's transient. If you ever want to find the most dissatisfied people in the world, look in the rich populations. Very unhappy. They will buy and buy and buy and buy and buy. And they are so idle-minded. You know this world today that's killing each other? You know who's paying for this? The corporations, the big guys, sitting up way up on the towers, pa passing rules and buttons. And we, the drones, the slaves, are doing the dirty work. While they're getting richer, we're getting poorer. Why? Because they are not satisfied. No matter how much wealth they have, They'll never be satisfied. I'll say, Allah says, Al-mal wal banun, zinatul hayatid dunya. Even your children, they are, they can be a distraction. They are a rahmah. But evaluate them and understand that at the end of the day, my passion is driven only for Allah. That's why Allah says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ The messenger is your best role model. لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَذَّكَرَ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا Meaning there are three things. 
The messenger is the best role model for who? The one who wants to return to Allah, who believes in the day of judgment and remembers Allah a lot. What does that mean? It means after traveling, after evaluating my world, after seeing my material stances and seeing my beauty and seeing all the gifts Allah has given me, all of this. When I evaluate it, it's transient. I will lose it. I'll grow old. That beautiful wife will be sleeping in a separate bed from me. Hmm? All the men that have killed for women, Imam Ali goes goes once to a grave. He says, oh, you men down there who have fought and killed for their women. I have news for you. Your women have been remarried. What's the news down there? Your money has been distributed. What's the news down there? Just like the messenger of Allah after the battle of Badr. He goes to all the dead ones among the Meccans. He says, so what did you find there? Huh? You came and fought us. You, you tried to kill us. Did you find what you were promised? <clears throat> did you find it? Look at the question. What is the Prophet saying? Evaluate for God's sakes. Don't be fooled. Oh mankind, beware of that day. You have been created to evaluate your mission. The passion is in you. Find it. Activate it. Move towards it. Know that nothing is better than progression. Nothing is better than standing upright. Look how Allah exemplifies. Can you compare a believer and a fasik? They cannot be compared. Can you compare the one who puts his face on the ground groveling? Yamshi mukibban. Can you compare the two? One who's upright in the path of Allah. Can you compare the two? Even ask the most wretched individual you say, an honorable, moral individual is superior to an immoral beast who's killing, murdering, taking money. Yes, he may have many cars and houses and may have empires on earth. They're useless human beings. Understand the mechanic stops. It's the spirit that's the highest, brothers and sisters. Tonight, I want us to evaluate that spirit. I tell you what I'm, what's driving me now. Every time I see a young child, I remember myself. When I see these young boys, I say, that was, I was, a that was me right there. That was me. I remember in Tanzania, I went to speak. And I remember I had this, this uh, feeling. I'm talking, and I saw a child sitting in front of me. I said, wow, yesterday, that was me, sitting on that same carpet, looking at a speaker and admiring like, wow, what a great person he is. And I said, wow, it's odd that, you know, I'm standing here speaking to this community. I came from America to Africa. That's amazing. Allah says, see, if you take one step, look where I put you. Just one step, proactively, look what I've done. But when I see that child, something palpitates in my heart. Allah says, I saved you. I brought you from Africa to America. I cradled you. I gave you parents who guided you. You could have gone astray in thousands of ways. You had a strong foundation. What are you going to do about it? My God, that never stops to drive me. 24 by 7, I say to myself, that's all I want. I can never pay back Allah, but the passion of seeing a child smile and read Quran and do his tasbih. The other day we were doing amal and we asked all the kids to go into sujood and said, ask Allah something. One boy says, I don't know what to ask. I said, talk to him. Have you ever spoken to him? He said, no. I said, talk to him. He's your friend. He loves you. Talk to him. He said, really? God will listen to me? I said, of course. You know, I stood there for a close to five to seven minutes, and none of the boys were coming up, and the girls. Their heads were on the floor, just doing the dhikr, dhikr. And I had this intense moment of crying. I said, wow, what an elegant sign of a child in sujood talking to his master, avoiding the, har the haram. If I can only protect this child till he becomes an adult where shaitan loses, maybe, maybe Allah on judgment day will consider us worthy for the gift he has given us. Sorry for taking more of your time. Thank you for your time. May Allah bless you. We'll end with a dua, inshallah. This passion and zeal, we'll talk more about it. 
Quran in Surah, Fur Surah Al Furqan, <clears throat> in other surahs, Allah talks about how a believer moves. Please evaluate. Every day you go home, first, we, we have a policy when we tell our children, go at home and look at your mother. Look at her face. Charles's face? I know my mother. I said, No, you don't know your mother. Oh, I know my mom. Of course I know my mother. I said, No, you don't know. Go and examine and stare at her and look at her nose. Look at her eyes. Look at her hair. When she's cutting food in the kitchen and she's preparing, look at her hands. Go near it. Smell it. Take a picture of it. Because you may not have it tomorrow. Examine it. It's powerful. When they're looking at you, priceless. Sit there for a second. Say, That's my mother. Wow. I can only have one. And if I lose her, I can't have another. Look at your father. Feel it. Touch it. Be with them. Hug them. Appreciate them. Those of us who have children, caress them. Kiss them. Guide them. Teach them. Don't hit them. Don't harm them. They're all ni'mah. They're all gifts of God. Measure it. And then say to God, wow. God, how can I not be passionate towards you? How can I not want to die for you? How can I not want to live only for you and for nothing else? We'll talk more about it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma adkhil ala ahli al-qubur al-surur. Allahumma aghni kulla faqir. Allahumma ashbi'a kulla ja'i. Allahumma aksa kulla uriyan. Allahumma aghdi dayna kulli madin. Allahumma farrij an kulli makroob. Allahumma rudda kulla gharib. اللهم فك كل أصير اللهم أصلح كل فاسد من أمور المسلمين اللهم اشف كل مريض اللهم صد فقرنا بغناك اللهم غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم اغض عنا الدين وأغننا من الفقر إنك على كل شيء قدير My brothers and sisters, thank you very much for being so kind and keeping this crowd uh, so attentive. I really appreciate it. والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته.